Hello, hello, my friends. It is Ondo. And welcome back to the Knights of the Nerd Republic. You know what to do. And stay profitable. The Nerd Academy podcast is released weekly at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, available on our website at www.thenerdacademypodcast.com and wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find the Nerd Academy podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can also help support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash the Nerd Academy podcast, where every donation allows us to bring you more exciting content every week. Hello there and welcome back to Knights of the Nerd Republic, the show where your favorite nerds talk all things about the galaxy far, far away. I am your host, Jared the Dark Jedi Bachman Stubbs, and it is time we've gotten to the end of Season 3 of The Mandalorian. I'm going to move my light back a little bit there. Uh, But we're here, we've reached the finale. I'm so excited to talk about this. I'm so excited to unpack it. I watched the episode when it first came out at 3 in the morning. And had a lot of feelings, <laughs> um, some of them conflicting. Upon a rewatch, upon getting to talk about it on uh, both For the Republic, Connor's other podcast, uh, with Connor's other uh, by podcast dad, uh, Andrew. Um, and I got to talk about it on Comic Book Cast. And the more I'm talking about it, the more I'm starting to like be at peace with it. So I'm very excited to jump into this conversation. Uh, but obviously, I am not alone. We got uh, we got our intern. He's new here. Well, we got Case and Breon. Hey, I didn't know I was going to be first this time. What's up? <laughs> I made a split decision. I was like, ah, Case. All right. Tight. Uh, I appreciate it. It's a it's a Mando review, so we have Spence the Mando Simpson. Everybody's got their first time being the first one bumped in, Casey. Congratulations. It was pretty cool. <laughs> Welcome Not to the team. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, bu- uh, bumped in first uh, without warning is typically the most fun for me to do. Uh, we also have the one eyed knight, the lore keeper, the Italian stallion, Hemi Neutron. He'd be running up and down the street. We got Connor Chiquiti. <laughs> What's Woo! up, everyone? The dope man How's himself. It, going, <laughs> it goes well. Nice uh, well. Phillies jersey you got uh, in the corner yep. there. Thank you, sir. It is of uh, Cliff Lee. Mm. Probably one of the best pitchers we had. I always love when Connor starts doing sports talk. It, it's, it's, it's still so foreign to hear Connor just go on like a sports rant, and it's like – It's like watching him become a different person. It's so much fun. (laughs) Uh, But we are not alone. We have a guest, a friend of the show, friend of all of Star Wars Twitter. We have Reagan. Hi. (laughs) Fellow fellow cursed by the cookie cop uh, individual. I'm I'm so sorry. (laughs) Listen, just when he starts telling you that you can't win trivia matches without him, that's when he needs to go. <laughs> that is the moment where your 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 cookie cup situation has gotten a little out of control. Um, but yeah, uh, very excited for this. Very excited to have Regan on the show for the first time. Uh, Regan is one of I I I I have a rule with uh, booking guests, and I try my best to like limit who we have onto other people with shows. And Regan is among the few exceptions. Because Reagan is that brilliant and that well spoken and knows her shit, uh, that despite not having a podcast or YouTube channel of her own, uh, she is very much welcome on here uh, because she could talk circles around all of us. Um, but before we jump into talking about Mando and those circles being run, we obviously have a word from our lovely sponsors at Sunday's Bloody Mary. You guys know the drill by now. Sunday's Bloody Mary has the most badass Bloody Mary accoutrement this side of the Hydean Way. They have their three-time award-winning spicy Caesar mix. And if the spice isn't for you, they also have their mild and traditional mixes. They got their award-winning dilly beans, uh, okra, and asparagus, as well as some rim salt if you're trying to get uh, nasty with your garnishes. And they have 
a cute line of tomato and Bloody Mary themed merch. So get on over to sundaysbloodymary.com. Use uh, code TNAP at checkout. That's T-N-A-P. You get 10% off your order and you help out your favorite nerds while you do it. So because we didn't, I, I, I was selfish with our review of the, uh, with the penultimate episode. It was just me and uh, trivia winner Scotty J. Rowe, uh, because we watched the episode together in the flesh, and I, I wanted to I wanted to unpack it with him. So just as like a real quick roundtable, um, how were we feeling going into this episode post the spies? Uh, Regan, as our guest, I'll uh, throw to you first. Um, I think that I was a little more activated than maybe the ultimate episode uh, warranted. Um, I feel like that The Spies um, was really satisfying in a lot of ways. And it it was kind of the episode I'd really been waiting for all season. Um, it set up so many exciting things. And for myself personally, as someone who is um, really inexplicably excited at the concept of Brendel Hux, because um, he was written for Brendan Gleeson, who's obviously Dom's dad. Um, and I love that character. I loved that factoid even when I first read it in the books. And when he popped up on screen, I had stopped that episode immediately because my first thought was like, oh my God, who is this random person? And then I went all the way to the end credits to make sure that it was a Gleeson. And when it was, I was just losing my mind. So anything that happened throughout the rest of the episode, I was like so elevated. And when like Pelion showed up, I was so elevated that like, I think I probably, um, it could have, it, the rest of it could have been bad and I was so excited I wouldn't have cared but it was a really good episode and it set me up for the idea that we were maybe going to have like an hour long super exciting super action packed super satisfying finale and I'm not saying that it that the finale that we got didn't have excitement and action in it um, but it did not I it it wasn't the episode that the spies kind of led me to believe that it might be but I don't know if that was the fault of the spies or the fault of me watching a lot of theorizing um, on various YouTube channels. So. Oh, pe pe people erroneously theorizing about star Wars. <laughs> When's that ever happened? <laughs> not what? Not when, Jeff, what, Jeff, when is anybody taxes, on this? <laughs> and people erroneously speculating about star Wars <laughs> Name three other name, three other certainties. Uh, <laughs> It's not like I was predicting a whole lot of things that didn't fucking happen. Uh, <laughs> Spencer, how are you feeling coming out of the spies going into the return? Um, feeling like for only having one episode left, there's a lot that hasn't been said that deserves to be. Um, when you come to the end, you, you realize that for the sake of time, a lot of choices are going to need to be made. And I was a little, I was a little disappointed that they did not do more with the, um, Oh, see now I can't even remember his name with Connor's character. Um, Dr. Persian, Dr. Persian, Dr. Persian. <laughs> Dr. Persian. Connor's character. that it just, it seemed like, like, Connor, a really, who do you play? It seemed like a really weird one-off, um, and I can't remember. given given how conclusive the season finale was, I'm not convinced. Have they announced another season of this show? Yes, Favreau and Filoni said that season four is already written and is likely to go into production late this year. Okay, well then they better revisit Pershing because otherwise that was a really interesting vignette, but a massive waste of time in my opinion. Um, but. Not bad. I mean, other than just like, wow, this all happened really quickly. It seem, it seems like just yesterday we were talking about the season two finale and what do we think is going to happen in season two. And I was like, I would love to see them retake Mandalore, but I doubt they're going to have the space to do it. Like that seems like such a large undertaking that they couldn't squeeze that and all the other things that I know they're going to try to do into season two. And they made it work. So it did seem a little a little rushed toward the end uh, for, for all the hype that got built up through two and a half. If you count <laughs> book of Boba Fett, like almost three seasons of Mandalorian to have it squeezed into just two or three episodes seemed a little, little crunched, but 
you know, I was I was ready for for what happened, and and yeah, it did see it, it wrapped up a little too nicely, I think, for for how much time it got, but um, but going into to the finale, I was like, there's no way they're gonna get it all done, and it and it be like in my opinion, neat storytelling. Um, like it seemed, it it all seemed to come a little too easily. Is I guess my main critique of the finale, which we can talk about later. Uh, but it just didn't seem like there was enough time to make it happen realistically. And I kind of, in my opinion, was proved right whenever everything wrapped up just a little too neatly. That's all I'll say. Okay. Okay. Well, we're coming right back to that here in a minute. <laughs> uh, Connor, thoughts coming in from Spies. So when I first watched it, the first thing I had, the first thing I thought was, okay, Din's probably going to get away. Like, we're probably going to see that in the next episode. I just didn't know, like, at what point it was going to happen. And that was before I went on social media. And once I did, and I saw a lot of people theorizing and saying that there's, oh, there's rumors that Din Djarin's going to die. And then there was that, like, Instagram <laughs> post by, I think it was Brendan Wayne, one of the one of two stump performers for... Uh, Din Djarin saying like, oh, be basically be careful what you wish for. And I'm like, they would have killed Din Djarin, would they? Like, I was like, eh, because I always knew, because I already knew about the whole like season four thing in the back of my head. So I'm like, there's no way, there's no way they're doing this. And I was like, wait, they possibly could kill Katan and I would be upsetty, but upsetty spaghetti if that happened. The only thing funnier than Connor with a straight face saying ups upsetty spaghetti <laughs> is Connor saying upsetty puschetti. <laughs> Did I say Everything slowed down Pusketti, for a minute Pusketti. on my end, and I'm like, say puschetti, please. I'm begging <laughs> you for a good Pasquale. <laughs> uh Pasquale? Um no, that's not this show. So I was just like, I was just because it was like finale, someone could die. The stakes seemed pretty high. I was like, I hope no one big dies. <laughs> and then like my one wish got dashed because I remember talking to people after the Mando movie was announced. I'm like, ooh, it would be really cool if Moff Gideon doesn't die in the show. So wait, then we can see him on big screen Star Wars. And then Mando season three was like, you sure about that? You sure about that? I don't know. I think. Wait, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Well, here's what I will say. Uh, I was waiting until we got a little deeper into the conversation to bring this up, but now's a good time. If memory serves, Giancarlo Esposito has made comments about season four. And here's the thing. This is a really dumb theory. The OG John Carl, the OG John Carl, OG Gideon has the mustache. None of the clones have the mustache. The Gideon we saw didn't have the mustache. Obviously, that proves nothing. But like, what if what if they killed the a clone? But I felt like I don't mean to interject, but I did feel like that was a like a possibility. Like I just no, figured I part had. of the reason that they were going to get rid of whatever iteration of Gideon we had is because they had the availability to bring him back in a face reveal later on at any point. So if I had to guess, I would say um, there was probably at least one successful force sensitive Gideon clone that maybe wasn't all the way cooked yet. Um that we can see later, but I have to ask a question and I'm sorry if this is poorly timed because oh, yeah. um, it did they officially announce that it was going to be a Mando movie? Because I know that they announced like a Filoni movie, but every YouTube outlet I have watched has repeatedly said it was going to be an heir to the empire. Let me movie. see. So I, what they I, said basically was that his movie was going to tie up uh, plot threads and be an epic finale for a lot of Mando related stuff. Got it. And that in tandem with Thrawn rising as the big bad, the cloning operation we've seen in Mando, this dark Jedi character with Balin seeming and reports kind of saying that he's going to be like the canon's answer to Jorah Sabayoth. 
uh, that it looks like it could be some reinterpolation of Heir to the Empire. And I think but if we, they try to do Heir to the Empire without Joris Sabayoth, I don't want it. I want it I, to be as silly as, as as the book is. Like, I want it to be absurd. <laughs> I, I, I'm i inclined to agree with you on some level there. I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what we get with Balin because, again, from what I understand, he is meant to be our new <clears throat> Joris Sabayoth in many ways. So I, I'm interested. I'm interested to see what they do there. Uh, but I think Heir to the Empire is kind of being used as a shorthand for Thrawn's story where the New Republic goes to war right. with him. Right. Um, in the same way that like, you know, a lot of people who cover comic book stuff have referred to any type of multiversal grand scale story as secret wars. Right. Um, you know, and well, we'll see how that goes. I'm very open to, and I keep using the word reinterpolate very specifically uh, because I don't even want to say an adaptation of heir to the empire, but to see some of the ideas kind of transmute and be pushed through uh, a funnel to work better within the new Canon. I would be very interested in seeing how that plays out. Um, Kaysen yes. thoughts coming out of the spies. Um, where was your head at? So, damn! I just rewatched body. the most recent episode. I watched it earlier today, and then I watched it again. Um, I don't. Know, I felt like we didn't really get a reveal of who the spies were, aside from like um, Eli Kane, like reporting back to Moff Gideon in that episode. Um, Word. And so, like, I felt like that was kind of unresolved. So I was like, okay, so somebody in this episode has to turn or, like, something has to happen here. But, I mean, I guess it was just a lie. I came reporting back to Mop Gideon. Like, I really thought that it was going to be, like, I was thinking maybe the armor. I don't know. Because, like, I have all the theories with, like, the horns on her helmet and then, like, you see Gideon with the Dark Trooper suit and he has the horns on the helmet. And you're like, eh. Well, so, like, who's the main encourager to get everybody back on Mandalore? Like, walking them right. into their yep. deaths? Right, exactly. Yeah, Maybe. and then like she leaves, and then she leaves the injured troops, and then I, I also kind of thought like, were they really injured, or like, are they also part of the spies? And they're she's just gonna take them back, and then they're gonna take out the fleet and strand them all there to die. Yeah, but obviously none of those things happened. Um, yeah, it was like the Mephisto theory of <laughs> of Mandalorian. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um. Casey, you finish what you're going to say because yeah, no, most I mean, of my that's... thoughts are going to be me taking a public L for all of my theorizing here. <laughs> yeah, like I, that was like the, the that was the one thing for me that I was kind of thrown off by, um, or like the one thing that I was like expecting to happen in this episode that didn't. Um, yeah, that's I mean that's pretty much all I got. So it is no secret that I very publicly from the moment that what episode was it i believe it was the pirate that ended with the reveal mm -hmm. that moff gideon's shuttle never made it to trial yeah and then there was best car alloy in the i so. went full alex jones um <laughs> and that is the only way i can describe it uh you can look at my twitter that's the gif i tweeted uh, I, I was like, it's, I was like, it's an inside job. It's a Mandalorian honeypot. Uh, immediately just went to that place. Um, they're putting chemicals in the best car. They're turning the Mandalorian <laughs> Imperial. <laughs> no, uh, no, bad baby, no squeezy. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I went all the way in on a lot of armor oh conspiracy God. theories. Uh, if you go watch, uh, I, I was lucky enough to get to be a guest on Scoundrels Inc. Uh, with some uh, illustrious Showdown alumni. And uh, they, they had me on because they knew I was going to go full InfoWars about the armor <laughs> um, and have been for weeks now. And I would like to say that uh, I was wrong. <clears throat> And what we do here when we speculate irresponsibly is take L's when you're wrong. I took that Mephisto L and I'm going to take the Armorer L for now. 
Um, I for now, uh, because I still don't fucking trust her. I still like on some like instinctual level do not trust the armorer fully, and I think a lot of it has to do with my own misgivings about like the children of the watches doctrine and trying to separate that from not trusting the armorer directly, but. Yeah, I was saying that it was an inside job. I was saying that the reason that she was seemingly the lone survivor of the... Taylor literally just poked her head in here to... Did you say that louder so the people can hear you? She said no. Uh, Taylor has been telling me the entire time leading up to this that I was being... She's watching me say because she wants to see me say I was wrong on camera. Uh, I made it, you fool. I, I, I... I was wrong about the armor and the children of the watch and it to You're what a fun loving Appalachian family. <laughs> <laughs> you got a big laugh. That was amazing. Fun loving Appalachian family. I love it. Uh that. but yeah, no, I, I, I was wrong. I, th- I thought it was a setup. I thought the armor was the lone survivor on Navarro. Uh, because she was gathering up Mandos for Gideon uh, to then have the have the, the 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 troublesome ones get purged, and the ones who were down for the cause be, get recruited into Gideon's uh, complement of super commandos. And I was seemingly wrong. I still have some misgivings about the children of the Watch, and I am going to give the Armorer the benefit of the doubt moving forward. Uh, but. Yeah, I, I I was very much on the uh, on the train of uh, just going full tinfoil hat anytime the armorer opened her mouth, and um, still have a lot of opinions about her and the children of the watch. But uh, I was wrong, and quite frankly, part of me is happy that I was wrong because we got a way happier, joyful ending to this season that I think we would have had had I been right. Too joyful. And Huh? Too happy. Yeah. Too joyful, too, too happy from Spencer. Too neat. Uh, well, okay. So I'm going to throw to you now to, 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 to elaborate on that because I'm, I'm curious as to what you mean with like a lot of the too happy, too neat. Because I personally, like the 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 how of this season, I think that there, I think there were some things that were left on the field uh, plot wise, narrative wise. But on the whole, I don't really have any misgivings with how like the Mandalore stuff was handled. You know, they, they took for, for me at least, you know, they took Mandalore back. I think going down the road, you know, very Hamilton, you know, winning was easy. Governing's harder. Uh, I, I think that down the road, that's what we're going to get a lot of. And that's where the, the easiness will go away. It was easy to unite and stop the man who, you know, carpet bombed the planet into oblivion. It's hard for us to actually coexist long term. And I want to hear your thoughts on the neatness, uh, Spencer. Um, yeah, well, I would say, I mean, they united to reoccupy Mandalore before they knew Gideon was there. And so I don't know that it was their opposition to gideon that temp like he, he, will there be a conflict down the line probably i mean there was already some some conflict whenever the groups were coming together where ax and and uh paz is that his name paz Vizla? yes yeah. we're butting heads on that little uh like like hover boat thing <laughs> it's not even like a hovercraft it's like very, a, a, very, a straight up hover ship it's it like gave hover- me very much very treasure planet vibes it did yeah, yeah. like treasure planet yeah. Yeah. barge so I think there will be some growing pains, but I don't think it's like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I think it was more like we have had enemies long enough that we can't afford to make enemies of each other. Um, I think that was the the idea that unified them in the first place. And then it was just like, oh, well, you're not currently trying to shoot me. So uh, so you can cover you can watch my back. <laughs> you know, like, well, let's deal with, let's deal with the imminent threat right in front of us. But in terms of it being too neat, I just like that entire episode. I was like, this is this is going too well. Like, this is going too well. Something's about to go seriously sideways. Yeah. And then it just didn't. 
and I and I like watch the credits and I'm like skimming through, you know, the seek bar yeah. in Disney Plus, like <laughs> looking for the end credit scene where like Din Djarin's cute little <laughs> homestead gets bombarded and blown up and like somebody <laughs> dies. And like I was just waiting for the catastrophe to happen because I was the like, Thrawn is- personally emerges from the mist carrying grief cargo and IG 11's head. Like, <laughs> yeah, like I guess there is something to be said for like the reverse psychology of, you know, the unexpected twist can become so common that the thing that is most unexpected is to get wrapped up with a bow. But I think that that is, that is, it's still not, it's still not great storytelling because we're, we're just like, what was that? <laughs> like we, 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 did, we went through three seasons of this for it to just be like, not a cakewalk, but for them to have like just one head on fight and then everything resolves beautifully and perfectly. Like if this were the end of Mando, if there were not season four coming, if he would not pop up in book of Boba Fett anymore, or like if this was it, if this was all we got from Mando, I'd be like, okay. Still, I think it, it gave me here. Let me describe it to you like this. It gave me the vibe in the last three episodes of the show it gave me the vibe of a show that was expecting to get a season four, but got canceled halfway through season three. And they were like, Oh crap, we have to wrap up some loose ends. Now that's the vibe I got from it, which is why I was like, I didn't, I haven't been following the behind the scenes stuff and the production stuff very closely, but whenever you told me up front uh, before we started, like, no, we are, we are getting a season four. I was like, Oh, what are they going to do now? <laughs> you know, it, it seems like everything that they set out to do in season three and even going back to season two, it's like, what more, what more does this story have to tell that would be unique to this story? You know, like what story can you tell in the Mandalorian that you can't tell outside of the Mandalorian? And it seems to me like for the most part, that story has been about Mandalorians and reclaiming their planet. It started as a bounty hunter with a kid, but then he ran into some of some, some people from various factions of his civilization that has been, you know, I mean, whenever you run into Bo-Katan Kree's after, you know, the, the destruction of Mandalore, the plot line that begs itself is, Oh, we got to take the planet back. Like we got to get our home back. And so like once, once you do, I'm like, okay, so could you tell more stories here? Sure. Should you? I don't know. Like maybe maybe make make way for a newer project. But I and saw I, I saw Reagan shaking her head in agreement. Yeah, I agree day. like so much with that. I mean, I also I wanna to add to what you're saying. Um, I was very prepared for it to like be a cliffhanger, to be kind of a loose ending. And I think that would have been more effective not necessarily with the mandalorians although maybe that too because that is you know that is the conclusion to such a big arc um and it just kind of it felt like it went out with a whimper it was i was very happy for them i was elated to see that get tied up but it was so underwhelming in the way that it happened and it felt very crammed in to too little time yeah. Um, and I think they're setting up maybe maybe this is also like the way that MCU style storytelling has altered my brain chemistry because maybe I have too much of an expectation that if I know they're building to something massive, I feel like everything should leave you wanting that a little more, you know, um, like but I one of my biggest complaints with a lot of things that I watch now is you never feel a real sense of peril. And like in Mando up until this point, like the first two seasons of Mando, you felt a true real sense of peril, maybe not impending dread, um, but you felt a sense of danger. And I didn't, I didn't feel that for most of this season, but I certainly like 
barely felt it in this episode. Um, like the big, like Din is only even, you know, he gets captured and that resolves itself within like less than 10 minutes into the episode. Mm. Um, I was also of the, um, the belief that, that Din might die this season because Pedro has, um, other scheduling commitments and he has, uh, made last of us, his first position for as many seasons as it gets. I incidentally also feel that, um, this season, suffered a lot because they just didn't have I really feel like uh if you look at the whole season um there are moments that just make it feel like it there there was different writing in place for having more of Pedro's time than they did and I think they had to make some alterations last minute um but like I would have been very happy to see Din's fate be a question mark at the end of the season to see him still in the hands of Gideon um and that rescue not happen um I think mm -hmm. that would have compelled the viewership uh a lot more to watch the season premiere of the next season, which um, honestly, like, uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to like get too much um, into like hearsay, but I honestly think I feel like the series is going to suffer because there's been so much absolutely erroneous negative press about its quote unquote declining viewership, which really isn't declining. Um, but when you have like a la, post rise of Skywalker, you have so many publications like Forbes, which has it out for star Wars to begin with um, saying, Oh, like the, the show's going so far downhill and this, that, and the other, I think it would have served a lot to have a viewership who was really invested in this storyline enough to want to turn, tune in for a season finale, uh, for a se I'm sorry, season premiere to know what happened. And now it's like, if they announced tomorrow that they, reverse the decision or Bob Iger, you know, in his like constant eviscerating of Disney budget right now was like, no, actually we're reorganizing streaming and we don't need to do another season of Mando. You know, like they left it in such like they left it in a place that it's almost going to be weird for them to come back and give Din and Grogu more problems, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I, that is, I hear what you guys are saying, and I'm so fascinated because I had such a different experience with these with these last two episodes, and you know it, it's why I like doing this show. It's because I have different Star Wars opinions from a lot of people, and I get excited for conversations like this because for me, you know, you know there were there were a lot of things that got set up that got put in the field of play that didn't necessarily get fully expanded upon as the season went on. But if there's one thing this season was very, very precise in establishing, it was that Mandalorians are indomitable when they join forces and put the quibbling aside. And I love the fact that they were able to take on this faux Mandalorian uh, force you know, that the Empire, as they off, often are to do, went on this, you know, bloodthirsty campaign of appropriating Mandalorian culture and, and, and stealing all of these elements from all these different peoples that they've conquered. Like Gideon says, you know, the, the, the weapons of the Mandalorian, the connection to the Force that the Jedi have, um, all, all of those things, that seeing them all commit to taking Mandalore back proved that this facsimile of Mandalorian hood could not stand that test and could not rise to the occasion of taking on the true Mandalorians. Uh, so I, I did love the way they were able to bring them to heal. And so many Star Wars stories, some of the best Star Wars stories end with like so much tragedy and longing. And for this story, this chapter in Din and Grogu's life to end in a, yeah, we made it out. We did the thing we needed to do. You know, Bo-Katan gets to lead a life as a leader, the children of the watch and, you know, like the re the greater Mandalorian society are at peace. They are not like warring with each other. Um, you know, there is that, you know, I, I, to, 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 to kind of counter a point Spencer made earlier, uh, with the whole like yeah there were tensions there I mean there weren't tensions like there was like like severe prejudice 
you know, and like granted Axe Woves is kind of a dickhead to begin with, but like that man could not talk about the children of the watch without calling them primitives, without having something like really gnarly and hateful to say about them. And you see them overcome that you see them truly put those, those like, like legitimate differences aside to, or considerable, I guess it's say not legitimate. I don't want to legitimize Axwell's being a prick. Uh, but to put all of that aside, truly join forces, bring the Empire to its knees on Mandalore, relight the forge, and fuse these uh, different factions together, like, it felt triumphant. It, it felt as triumphant as it should because, as Bo said, you know, the Mandalorians would have been unstoppable if they had, you know, put all of these... Uh, silly differences aside, I've brought this up many times uh, across guest spots, but you know, every time there is some type of uh, fascist movement on the rise, the thing that gives them more powerful than anything are the people who are willing to stand against them, fighting each other harder than they're fighting the fascists. And we saw what happens when that doesn't happen. We saw the 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 Mandalorians do what we know the New Republic will fail to do. Um, and with regards to how it all ends, you know, season one and season two both could have both. I, I think you could describe with that level of finality, you know, season one could end as in, in a place of and then they went adventuring together forever and, you know, kind of left ambiguous. Season two could have ended. Grogu went on to become a Jedi Knight and then, uh, you know, lived as his own independent person not beholden to the cult that makes him keep his helmet on. And I feel like the Mandalorian is for a show that is so serialized that has its, its, its fingers in so many pots across the star Wars lore and mythos, pardon my hiccup that they have surprisingly final endings for every season. And I am very much looking forward to independent contractor, you know, Aldo Rain style Imperial Hunter Din Djarin, you know, setting off across the galaxy that I think then will begin the uh, the, the beginning of Thrawn's emergence and see in Din seeing firsthand, you know, aside from like the Imperial stronghold on Mandalore, like, no, like the Empire is still very much here to play and Din having to contend with that and beginning this coming war that we will see this war that we will likely see play out between Thrawn's remnant forces and uh, the new Republic and whatever forces they can spare uh, come time for the Filoni movie. And granted, you know, like Reagan said, maybe this is MCU brain. Maybe this is me doing that thing where it's like, Oh, I can see how it's all leading together. You know, we all thought that, uh, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness was going to be what we now know Secret Wars will probably be, when the multiverse is a coming unraveled and every, all hell's breaking loose because of Loki and WandaVision and Spider-Man and oh my god. Um, when in reality, it was the beginning of us realizing that the multiverse is coming untethered. And I think we have a similar thing here, where like I think all of us were expecting this to be the big, big beginning, when in reality this was ending a chapter to begin this phase of Din Djarin on the front line of what will become this like second mini galactic civil war. Um, but again, that, 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 that was my reaction to it. Uh, and with Reagan Spencer, your complaints are very valid. And like I said, I, I, I like, I like the different interpretations. It makes me happy. Um, With, with regards to that, because uh, the three of us have been going for a minute, Kaysen and Connor, whichever you guys, whichever one of you guys want to go first, where do you think we go from here with this seeming Ooh. happy ending, Looney Tunes close out and all? Uh, do, do we know what the timelines are for like what year the Filoni movie and then season four of Mando will come out? Like, is season four of Mando going to come out before or after the Filoni movie? We don't know. I think the Filoni movie is slated, like like rumored to be slated for 2027. I know for, okay. from what I remember, we're getting the Ray movie first. Okay. Yeah, the director of the Ray movie just actually said that on on TikTok like today or or yesterday. 
Oh, good. Yeah. And it's supposed I to be 15 years after. That. Yeah, after Rise of Skywalker, which I still can't believe is happening, man. I know. Every time I think yeah. about it, I get happy. I watching the celebration, like closing ceremony recap, uh, whenever they like they showed the moment Daisy Ridley came out, I started to cry. I'm so excited about that. I'm never gonna stop being excited for that. I love my girl. Anyway, uh, as you were saying, Casey. Um that like the Mandoverse, I love that. Um, the Mandoverse takes place like between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens, right? Yeah, yeah. Five years okay. after the Battle of Jakku. Okay. So like, wait, no, I thought it was five. I think it's five years after Endor, so four years after Jakku. Okay. Yeah. Um. So like, when we get the Ray movie, it's gonna be how many years from where we're at right now in Mando? That's gonna be what. Probably approximately 30? 50 years. Approximately 50, 50 years. Okay. It's 30, so we could it 35 well years between Jedi and Force Awakens? 30? No. No. 34. Uh, yeah, it's 34 between Jedi and Force, and then 15 years after Rise of Skywalker is when the Ray movie happens. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah, okay. 50. Yeah, 50 yeah. ABY, because Rise of Skywalker is one year after uh the TFA Force Awakens and Last Jedi. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can't do that. So, math. like, in that Ray movie, we could very well get a Grogu in her Jedi Temple. Oh, if I, I'm think being up, I think that's guaranteed. I feel like that's, yeah, like, it has, it's like it has to happen. It's probably guaranteed, but I kind of hope not. Oh, uh, you don't Grogu want it? I, I, you I, don't want I'm it? I'm going to stay Mandalorian. I, I want him just to kind of just... They don't yeah. need those two stories. I feel like don't need to interconnect. I just I don't know. Eh, I, I I'm like, with you, Connor. I'm I feel with like you, if Connor. You put Grogu in Ray's movie. There's a chance of like Grogu overshadowing Ray because it's like you put you pit the two worst parts of the fan base against each other. <laughs> the, bit, the guys who are like super into Grogu for some whatever reason because of oh, like it's, it's his like the Mando versus Dude Bros versus yeah. like the the Mando versus Dude Bros. Combined with the Ray haters, it's a recipe for disaster. I mean, but also, I also don't think he's going to overshadow her necessarily because he won't be cute by that time. You know, he won't be as yeah, marketably... like, at that point, he will have matured at least a little bit more and he'll probably be a little bit bigger and maybe be able to. Dude, we don't, I don't even think we know like the, the Easter Bunny process for Yoda's. Species. We don't because it doesn't make sense if you actually look at it and like figure that like Yoda was 900 when he died. Like, Grogu should still be significantly bigger at 50 yeah. than, than he is. But as Alex Damon once said, this species must hit puberty. And Spencer said this before as well. This species must hit puberty like a fucking freight train. Yeah. That like, yeah, it's... like we're going to get that Ray movie and he's going to be like, you know, not, he's, he's going to be like two feet tall and just stacked or something. <laughs> not small. He's going to be small. Oh, dude. Swolgu? We'll probably get go. Swolgu. Swolgu. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, right. no, no. Somebody who's watching this, because I don't have the skills, somebody who's watching this, please Photoshop Swolgu for me. <laughs> or don't. Make him like don't buff do or, don't or don't. Do don't, 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 do don't. Do not do it. Do it. For the oh, love come of on. We have, Sh holy... we have Shaq T. For no, the love? No. For no, the... no. Do not invoke his name. No. Stop. No. <laughs> Stop. I hate this. Why, Casey? Why? Why must you invoke that name? Because upon it's like Beetlejuice. Body. I said it three Make times. it go away, Jared. Make it go away. <laughs> Stop. Thank you, Charlie Ashby from the Imperial Center podcast. God damn yes. it, Charlie. Charlie, you have Dooku eyes. This is why. This is why you're zero and two against us. Oh. <laughs> I thought uh, that was an epic confrontations joke, and then I realized that was a history joke. <laughs> Um, which made it better. Uh, yes. No, I mean, I'm I'm curious to see where the Grogu stuff goes. I really do love the idea that Grogu is able to, you know, uh, you know. Shouts out to Pink Milk. They had their big final live stream the other night, and M was really harping on the idea that like Grogu could be the next Tar Vizsla, could be the next person right. to bridge the gap between the Mandalorians and the Jedi. 
which like in many ways for this like Mandalorian renaissance that we're seeing the beginning of with the forge being relit and Mandalore being taken back that the, like, like that feels like the final step. Like now that Mandalore is back is not only, you know, back to its former glory, but at peace without a hundreds of warring, you know, like interwarring factions. Right. Now the Mandalorians are going to put aside their differences permanently with the Jedi. And they do so with the great unifier that is Grogu. And we see his potential for that in the spies, you know, we're like, that is one of the best scenes. I had a conversation whenever I was on comic book cast uh, earlier this week, you know, Mitch made a joke about the, the IG 12 mech. And he was like, it feels like it was there as a toy uh, in that very cynical way. And I was like, you know, sure. You know, the same way Bo-Katan lost a pauldron and now, you know, the same way there's Funko Pops and action figures of Din Djarin in his original suit, his Beskar suit, uh, post getting the mud horn with the spear, with the dark saber, all of those. Um, sure, there's the toy, but also that facilitated. No, no, no. Yeah. No. That's what Dude, that was there. I for, love it. To show Grogu doing that. And also... I don't know what it was. And this happened with the rescue as well. Last season. It was the second time I watched this episode was when the waterworks were just out of fucking control for me. And I, my first big cry and I had several, the second time I watched this episode was when Grogu just frantically started trying to hit Din with the back to spray. Mm. Yeah. Like, because again, he's a little kid. He doesn't understand that he's not hitting him at all. Yeah, which he is cute. Get it. Like he, he's he's just spraying it on his helmet. If anything, he made it harder for Din to see, uh, <laughs> in right. many ways, because he just kind of sprayed it all over his visor. He hit him with some blinker fluid. It was some. Take me laugh like that, asshole! But um, he he you know spraying him down. I burst into tears. He just wants to take care of his dad. Dad, are you okay? It's so sweet. Uh, but I do love the idea of Grogu being part of race temple, that he's part of this like great unifier of the Jedi and the Mandalorians. And that like this new era we're going to move into post Skywalker saga, just saying those words excites me so much, like has the potential to be like the galaxy's next golden age, you know? And it's I, th I think it would be really cool as someone for me who really loves the High Republic to get to see that you saw you saw the way that the Jedi and the Republic as institutions flourished and that after hopefully finally working out these bugs, you know, of what makes the Jedi fall apart at the seams, why the Mandalorians can't fucking get along, you know, where and when the Republic should be involving themselves and when they shouldn't be, that we finally figured all of that out, that now, after the final order and the Sith have been defeated, we're going to fucking get it right now. We're going to get it right. My only hope for Rey is somehow, some way, she finds out about the High Republic and just reads about it, interacts with a few Jedi here or there, a la Virgences in the Force like Luke did with Elzar, or just maybe another unique uh, way of just finding out about the High Republic that doesn't necessarily mean like talking with other Jedi or just like reading books, although I assume the, those books that uh, Luke had probably have a lot of stuff on the high republic like the high republic is pretty much i think you might have said it jared or someone else said it like the high republic jedi are like if the jedi go to therapy like that's they're, they're probably some of the best versions of the jedi that we've gotten outside of like all the pretty much post prequel jedi the Je they're just the best they're the best in the way that like I can't speak today. <laughs> They're the best Jedi organizationally. Yeah. Mm. And I think <clears throat> an institution that's taking point from the Mandalore from the High Republic are, are the ones that could finally make peace with Mandalore properly. Um, especially with like Bo Katan being at the forefront of like this new Mandalorian 
uh, like this Mandalorian Renaissance that like bo says to Grogu, you know, I've worked with a lot of Jedi in my time. That makes her one of the perfect people to, to, to take point, to instill in Mandalorian culture the Jedi are not our enemies. Um, if anything, the Jedi have shown up for us more than any other galaxy-wide faction. Uh, you know, then you can get into, like, the capital J Jedi-hood of Ahsoka if you want to. But, like, you know, they sent one of their best to help us take our take our world back from the Sith and you know, how many times have the Jedi like laid down their lives in some way, shape or form when we were at our worst, when, you know, someone like Bo-Katan was like at odds with them via death watch. Um, so I do think there's a lot of potential there for Grogu to grow up and become part of that new order. Um, and I think it'll set up a lot of like fun, really weird interconnectivity that in the same way, I've always said that, uh, I, I look at Rogue One Solo and the Clone Wars movie as this like weird trilogy in some way. We're like they're, they're, they're this weird trilogy about like what's going on just beyond the, what we see in the main movies, even though it involves a lot of like the main characters like the these are the everyday adventures when it's not like episode blank, 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 blank of the blank. Uh, when it's like the, when the stakes are that big and that high or the little people who are involved um, who are scattered all up in this mess. I think that these three movies that got announced could end up being their own like weird anthology trilogy in a way where you have Grogu and Ray's order. And then the next movie you get is seeing uh, like Grogu and Din's like last big adventure, perhaps. And then you throw it all the way back to that Jedi stuff with James Mangold's Dawn of the Jedi story. Um, I do think the Mandalorian is going to seed a lot of ground moving forward for that. And thankfully, you know, we're going to get a better idea. So what the galaxy is going to look like, cause we have Ahsoka in a few months that could very easily yeah. help us clear up. What the fuck is Din going to do next? I think that that was, you know, kind of goes into another one of my issues is that I really started to feel like the season of The Mandalorian was the we're saving all the good stuff for Ahsoka show. Um, and I think that that will happen. I definitely think that that we will get glimpses of that. I do also just want to interject because nobody said it. I also very firmly believe that um, part of the reason the writers gave Grogu, the IG-12 with yes, no capabilities as a plot device is because I think um, I, I think that is for Grogu to be able to reject getting the helmet when it is time for him to get it. I really believe that in my soul because um, I think that he, uh, like there are a lot of things that he doesn't understand, but um, he is, uh, he has a pretty good, sense of what he wants and does not want and i don't really see him rejecting one indoctrination just to be totally comfortable in another i think he's very happy to be adopted by din and i think that um he's very now connected with mandalore but i think that um part that ig12 is partly a plot device to allow him to be able to reject the uh the more zealous um and yeah. dogmatic parts of it well, I, I think that at its core, you know, and, and again, maybe this is me continuing to have my own issues with the children of the watch, but I, I, I have always interpreted Grogu as not giving a damn about any of these orders or faction. It's his dad. Where Din goes, he's going to go. Right. And if that makes him a Mandalorian, it makes him a Mandalorian. Uh, but Din wasn't a Jedi, so he couldn't be a Jedi. And I think as Grogu gets older and starts to understand the world around him better, I think that he will embrace Mandalorian culture and also see his heritage as a Jedi and want to lean into that. And again, like they're, they're, like that's what I loved so much about this season is that the sky is now the limit. You know, there is a lot of potential now that has been given to us because like every opening stop talking robot. Uh, every, <laughs> Every, now I feel like Din. I'm just going to donkey kick my fucking watch. Uh, but He likes droids now. Oh every, my god. If, except for when he doesn't, which is... I just forgot about that. Season. I just forgot. I just... I forgot about that whole thing. And, um... 
was it chapter 22 with Jack Black? Yes. Where he just starts just going ham on these super battle droids. Yeah. I just was dying laughing. It was at so that. funny. It was so funny. Um, but like it, every opening conceit of this show has been wrapped up, which means we now get to move again into this like really fascinating new era that then that, that that does excite me a lot that you know like the main things that were set up where mandalore was destroyed we need to get it back and we need to get grogu to his family parts one and part two done uh sets up the uh imperial war stuff a lot um kind of bringing it back to the episode itself unless the future implications um i also want to say you know, and, and we, 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 we try to not get caught up in just, you know, lightsaber go burr type discussions. Uh, you know, we, 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 we try to really get into the weeds and talk about what this stuff means. Um, but lightsaber do go burr. And this was some of my favorite action I've seen in this whole show. And that's yeah. saying something because the stunt coordinators put on a good show every time all hell breaks loose and this episode was no exception oh my god the action was dude the armor flying now. around just bashing people with her hammer was so sick like watching her and bo katan go back and forth where it's like dong hammer and then bo katan sheen, dark blade it was mm, very good i i liked it a lot I one of my favorite shots, I think, of this entire show, and it just made me really happy to see, like again. I say this as somebody who's never been that into like the Mandalorian stuff, but like that shot of like Bo Katan, you know, I'm gonna just just do the like charge kind of gesture with the dark saber. Yeah. I was that that filled me with so much joy, like because we've seen it in animation. Yeah. We get to see it in live action. We we know how much it means right now to everybody involved, and like Bo Katan's like silent charge with the dark saber hit for me the way I think because there's more of us. Poe was supposed to in the Rise of Skywalker. Like I like I was more ready to like stand up on the couch and start throwing shit whenever like all of the Mandalorians were just going straight down into the chasm to start tearing ass. <laughs> Connor forgot he wasn't muted. <laughs> Connor forgot he was No, if Connor forgot he wasn't muted, he just would have been talking about the fucking Imperial pastries. Um, but... What? Like, that, no, that, that wasn't, show. guys. That wasn't Connor. That was, that was him. <laughs> Oh, I knew who it was. I, made a joke. I knew it I was, was Babu. <laughs> I accidentally squeezed his foot. That wasn't Connor. Bad Reagan, no squeezy. No squeezy. <laughs> he thought it was funny. Uh, but like seeing that, that shot with them all going down, like it, it just it filled me with so much joy and so much excitement. Uh, watching Din bare knuckle his way, uh, both out of cap captivity. <laughs> But, which was cool. That's one of my big complaints. Like it was staged well, so I can like. It's one of those you did it well. It's not the decision I would have made, but I still am not super into the decision. Always, baby. That mm. that Din got out of captivity pretty quickly. Um, I wish there would have been more playing towards we got to save Din. Uh, I love Grogu's involvement. I wish Gro. I mean, again, like give the episode like an extra like five minutes. So that Grogu can be kind of like the sole architect of Din's rescue. I would have been into that. Um, yeah. But like Din getting loose, the very video gamey R5 next gate uh, was fantastic. Uh, dude, when I was R5 on getting his chance to shine, like just R5 getting his chance to shine in this entire season is just one of the highlights of it for me. Yes. Just and goddamn. I appreciate them. R5's getting, like, got that be... dog in him. Okay. <laughs> yes. Like, well, you got to warn me, Connor, because now I got to play the clip. Hold on. Got that dog at 12. <laughs> there we go. Like, he does, you know? Yes. And yeah, it was very video gamey. And it just, again, maybe it's because, like, I kept thinking, oh, what if Din Djarin, like, actually dies? Yeah. Like, dude. 
I was tense as all hell. At oh my god! Yeah, that was another thing that like I that I feel bad for Reagan not feeling a whole lot of peril because I spent this entire episode quite literally on the edge of my seat. Oh, Same. I was I was legit on my I I watched this on my phone because like I went to bed at like nine o'clock because I was like super exhausted, and so I went to bed. And then I woke up at like 2.15 to go to the bathroom. And I just kind of stayed up and I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I said I wouldn't do a 3 a.m. Star Wars drop anymore. That's that. This will be the exception to that. So I, I lied. watched the Mando episode. <laughs> Wait, what was that, Jared? I lied. I lied. <laughs> Congratulations on making it into the program. Thank you. Have you been in Coruscant long? No. Well, I think you will find it a very lovely city. <laughs> we only have this and then the season review to use that again, so I got to make it count. Oh, um, yes. you use that for air. But I was just like, oh my god, what the hell's going to happen? Because I felt, I felt it there. I felt against the Praetorian guards. I especially felt it with Moff Gideon. Yes. Who we think and is Moff Gideon. Oh, oh, maybe yes. Gideon. I also, Gideon. with what we were talking about, I, or maybe this is on For the Republic, the, the idea that, like, the way we're going to tell the difference between Gideons is that the real one has a mustache is so fucking funny and silly. Yeah, today. was Connor saying that? Uh, no, I believe uh, Donovan on For the Republic said it. I've been on so many podcasts today, all of them are starting to blur together. Um, <laughs> but I... With the, the the laser gate scene, and Connor, I know you'll appreciate this. It really reminded me of that final room in Fortress Inquisitorius before you fight Trilla and then Vader. Oh yeah, with all like the uh, with all the stormtroopers, like the... when you fight the like that last purge trooper, it really felt like that like last moment to feel like a badass before you're going to be truly fighting for your life. Yeah, you know. Uh, the, the, it felt very video gamey, which is which is praise both praise and criticism I've heard levied at the Mandalorian before. Uh, you said laser I've gate. Said. I was just like Jared's gonna make some Alex Jones type joke because <laughs> like that was where my mind went for some dumb reason. Laser They're gate. putting chemicals in the plasma that turns the freaking laser gay. Huh? You can get there? Uh, nope. Tough podcast. Anyway, uh, but no, the, the Gideon fight was incredible. We don't often get people just scrapping in Star Wars, you know? And I know that eventually it did turn back into like a high tech weapons and lasers and shit. Uh, but just Din going fuck it and tackling Gideon and it just turning into a best car knuckled brawl. Loved that. Also, the sound design on Gideon's Dark Trooper Mando armor. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like fusing the like fusing the sound design of the Mandalorians with that like really deep resonant <laughs> that you get from the Dark Troopers in season two was just music to my ears. This was this may be my favorite sounding episode of The Mandalorian, uh, which is such a stupid nerdy thing to say, but it's true. Um it's fair. Everything, the fight choreography was incredible, especially with like Din and Grogu versus the Praetorian Guard. I love that, you know, you, again, you, you see Grogu's progression through these three uh, and a half seasons. Dude, I was of so scared for Grogu for some dumb reason. I was Dude, like, me too. Hey, I know hey, they yeah. weren't going to, I knew they were going to let the baby die by way of getting stabbed with a plasma spear, you know? Like, I knew good and goddamn well that was never going to happen. I yeah. was terrified the, the entire time. <laughs> when the mech suit stumbled and the door started closing, I was like, <laughs> my boy. <laughs> I was so concerned. I was terrified. Mr. 100%. Breon, can you make that noise for us again one more time? Uh, which one? The squeal? And then the my yeah. boy? Uh, I could try to. Oh, didn't work. <laughs> nope. You got one out of me. That's it. <clears throat> I do an inhale when I do that, so it's kind of hard to get it again. <laughs> Uh, like, like almost a raptor screech. Um, yeah, but no, I, but you, you know, you go back to season one where Grogu cannot use the force at all without passing out. And then you get into yeah. season two where he's like fighting the stormtroopers in his prison cell on Gideon's Gazanti. And then he can only do it for so long. And then he's kind of like, 
and then it kind of plops down. And then you get to season three, or sorry, it's Book of Boba Fett, um, where you see him training with Luke and Luke trying to coach him through a lot of this stuff. And again, Luke's training saved Grogu's life multiple times this season. You know, I know people like to do the Pedro when he was on SNL with the my baby do not have ADD. <laughs> he just he likes to jump. To jump. <laughs> uh, just very true of uh, little Din Grogu. But, uh, you know, we see yeah, him kind of doing like the same acrobatics too. we saw him do with Luke on Osis. And we see him ca like calling on the force in such a way that is like not just he he's not just like picking things up and throwing them like he's being strategic with it you know like we saw grogu like take the time twice to start throwing people's weapons away instead of just force pu pushing the person which you know it, it shows growth for him i think you know before he would have thought oh i'll just keep using the force on this one guy and he goes no if i take your weapon away it leaves you open for dead that's he gives my dad a chance to put a couple in you real quick before he pays attention yeah. to the next guy i love the synergy between them and whenever it just turned into Gideon getting jumped at the end, um, I love that everybody's sliding across this floor, which uh, patrons, you rest assured that next season, that area where the fight with Gideon happened, uh, that is absolutely going to be a versus arena. Uh, Cause Hell that yeah. is, Oh yeah, that is, that is exactly the kind of shit that I love to see my star Wars fights happen in. Um, just ledges and extra room and a that poor mouse forever. droid. Huh? That poor mouse droid. Uh, that poor mouse droid. Um, but whenever you like Grogu watches Bo sliding through with the ray shield on her gauntlet, and she sees Din sliding through, going full like uh, Harvey Dent in Arkham City, two guns, bitch. Uh, you know, trying to put a couple in Gideon, sliding across the floor. What's Grogu do for no fucking reason? Slide as he force pushes. Uh, Gideon's electro staff off the off the cliff again, which which I just loved. Everybody came together, and that was the point of this season. He's like, oh, it's aimless, it's aimless. No, the point was people were uniting to fight for Mandalore, to fight for each other. Um, and I was just a blubbering mess of tears uh, the second time I watched when Grogu had like the the force barrier protecting them from the inferno Dude, that okay. cooked we Gideon need to talk alive. About, like everything not everything before that but like sort of before that when like yes Bo Katan joined the fight. Dude I that was flying so shoulder kick I was so freaking worried for her man. When, oh, oh when it I was got to the point yeah. when it got to the point in the fight where like her helmet came off and she was just like kneeling down with Gideon after after the dark saber was destroyed, which I will say, I did tweet about it, but I will say it on air here. I do find it really funny that Gideon was the one to destroy the dark saber when he was considering he was the one to say the dark saber doesn't have power. The story does in the season two finale, and so my dumbass think my dumbass brain was like, well, what if that? Well, let's make a new story then. Yeah. Um, that's exactly it and it's it's gideon doing like a classic star wars thing where the villain accidentally proves himself wrong you yep. know it uh like go back to palpatine in return of the jedi you know your arrogance is your weakness your faith in your friends is yours well you know he said friends but like that extends to all of luke's loved ones what saves him his father yep but like nothing palpatine did could on that ship would have stopped the Death Star being blown up. No matter what, Sidious was wrong. He didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. So Gideon having this petulant, you know, <coughs> Mandalorians are useless without their trinkets and, you know, crushing the Darksaber again in that like petulant temper tantrum. Cause he, I don't think, I think he realized that like he wasn't going to win that duel. So he had to cheat. And the only way for him to cheat was to disarm her in such a way that he didn't get what he wanted. I was like, uh, like, dude, when it, when it, when he like broke it and it dropped, I was like, oh, we're going there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Same reaction here. And it, um, and it further proves what Din was saying as well in the previous episode. I was episode. scared for Bo Katan. Like, when it oh, got yeah. to that point oh, where she was yeah. helmetless and like looking up at, 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 uh, Moff Gideon, I was like, 
don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And I was very happy that it wasn't done and that she survived. It was not done. That was when uh, Din Two Guns Bitch Jarin came through uh, <laughs> with the yes. blickies. With the blickies. So um, my question about that is why did he go with... I mean, like, him dueling in the blickies is really, really cool. Like, I, I enjoyed it. But also, like, why did he not think, oh, I could take one or two of these... Praetorian guard weapons. Like I could fucking electro lasso this bitch and then well, just go I, in. I don't think Din bah, likes bah. weapons like that. I think we've seen from Din. He that, just likes like, guns. He likes a gun. Din likes a gun. Yeah. The only like <laughs> like close range like he got, weapon he, he he's ever last been time. proficient with was the spear. But even yeah. then, like that's still like kind of an at range weapon that he was like, yeah, fair. He, that he wasn't like, he like, if you go back to that fight, he's basically holding the spear. Like it's a long fucking sword. Yeah. That he's just using a big stick to whack at Gideon the whole time. Um, that again, I think is really funny that it happened that way, but I just like that. Exactly. That that didn't just like, nah, I like my guns. He, he is, he is the, uh, Raiders of the lost Ark joke incarnate in star he's a Wars. Cowboy. He he's a cowboy. He he is a space cowboy. Space cowboy. Um, but yeah, no, I, I that that whole brawl just was so tense and it was so satisfying. And one of my favorite musical cues of this season, I think, uh, that happens in that fight and it happened in the previous episode was that really cool amalgamation of Ludwig's uh, Gideon theme with the Dark Trooper theme. Where you had both that like driving no 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 that happens with Gideon's theme with the that weird like dubstep for the Dark Troopers. Uh, I cannot wait for the season three soundtrack just for that track. <laughs> um, Spencer is my fellow versus series guy. How are you feeling about this uh, this, this brawl here at the end? Um, just like in general, or about yeah. Like I'm, in, I'm in trying to do lightsaber of... goes burr with you right now. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to just relish in a good fucking fight. You know? Yeah, it was, it was a good fight. I remember, I remember it, and I, and I can't recall specifically what moves they were, but there were two different, there were two different moments in that whole final sequence where I was like, oh, that was a good move. Like, you, you know, if if I died to that move. I probably wouldn't be mad about it. I'd be like, yeah, yeah that was a good move. Um, I'm going to say one of them, one of the two was Bo-Katan with the, with the, the saber, maybe when she did that slide move. Um, and, and just, just, it, it, it looked really cool, but yeah, I was, it was a great time. The choreography was excellent as always. Oh my God. I, I this, who, the, whoever is choreographing a lot of these big fights, you know, just really understands how to frame a Star Wars fight. Like it, I, I like th between this and Luke at the end of the rescue, like are some of the best, like modern Star Wars action scenes we've seen yet. You know, like everything about the staging of Luke and how I, I, I will never stop thinking about that weird little like spin on his knees. He does coming through the final hallway push like that little bit of choreography is going to stay with me the same way Bo kind of like doing like a little pommel jab and then trying to get Gideon's throat. Um, that was another one. Also going back to the Praetorian guard fight. Taylor is still in mourning for Paz Vizsla. <laughs> oh yeah, hundred percent. She was she was given some solace with the fact that not only did Din stab one of the Praetorian guards in the neck, then put the barrel of the blaster under the dude's helmet and pop pop. That shit was gruesome. That shit was nasty. And I've always been curious about what was going to happen when we got some real Mando on Mando violence in this show. Is whether or not it was going to be like, oh, they broke through the Beskar, or it was like, no, they're wearing impenetrable armor, hit them in the soft places, uh, <laughs> and it was just going to be that viciously violent. It's always nice to me that they they give everybody convenient soft places, like, <laughs> yeah. 
why can't the plane be made out of the black box? <laughs> um, uh, but for Mandalorians, uh, that, that was another thing that I like. That was another great shot where like you see Bo just run that one super commando through. Um, yep. Just the, 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 this whole battle. I just, uh, uh, Taylor I and I are planning on doing a Mando versus rewatch in time for skeleton crew. And I am counting the seconds to return to this, uh, battle. But, uh, yeah. Uh, unless anybody has any final thoughts on this episode, uh, are we ready to call it? I do just want to say one thing super quick. Please do. Um, Please I do. didn't, I don't want to come off as overly negative as I feel like I did. I didn't, I, um, I didn't dislike this episode. I just wasn't delighted by it in the way that I am. Um, my, my, one of my, my biggest maybe disappointments is that I, I kind of felt that at the start of the series, um, Din's arc was going to be moving away from his indoctrination. And I feel like we've ended up with him further in it. I'm really not sure how much of that is because they really no longer have access to Pedro's face in the way that they did. Um, so that, that <laughs> kind of put a big stain on it a little bit for me. Um, but uh, I, I, like everything that you said about the sound design and about the fight choreography were absolute highlights of the episode for me. And I also, I just, um, one thing that I wanted to add is that I really like how much, um, like this series in particular, but all of the streaming series have kind of moved away from the standardized Star Wars confrontation um you know roulette that they always do i thought that um it wasn't just that the fights were well staged they were really interesting um like and uh like when i used to work in film stupid tidbit of mine you know the first films that i worked on were all fight movies they were all martial arts movies they were all movies where people were beating each other up um and i really like like just recognizing the mix of um, interestingly applied techniques was really enjoyable for me. Um, having having said all that, um, you know, I I think that like everyone who had the passion that you guys all have and who felt like the joy and the elation of watching this episode also probably just I, it deserved more of an episode. Um, maybe like, you know, we're not on the same page of like, oh, I would have preferred it to be kind of an open ending and, and be interesting. But like, even for all of that, that joy that you felt um, and for all of that excitement, um, like, like it deserved more time, even just a few more minutes to play out um, better. But ultimately, yeah, I'm glad that a, all, almost all but one of my predictions were wrong. I am glad that everybody uh, came out of it safe and sound. And I'm really glad that we have gotten to see um, not just the Mandalorians, but Bo-Katan in particular, um, get a really satisfying, fully realized arc. And I get that she, you know, I really like that um, she, like, the biggest, you know, the, the biggest question mark with Bo-Katan always was like, um, you know, is, is Valor earned? Is her position earned? And that if, if there was one satisfying conclusion for me for this entire episode and this, and this entire season was that she comes out of it with no question mark. Um, she has, she has earned her rightful place. Um, I think that, uh, you know, her valor and her merit is no longer arguable. Um, and I'm really proud of her. And that was really nice. 100%. I couldn't agree with everything you said there uh, more because I also will always never argue for more Star Wars. Um, <laughs> even if it Listen, is about Bo quietly had one of just the most interesting story has, has had one of the most interesting stories I think we've seen in all of canon. And yeah. like, her and Ahsoka um, get to have these like, like epic in terms of you know grand, wide sweeping narratives, and we just don't I... talk about them because they're like 
they're central they're like pretty centered but like not super central like din story is like yeah other like other characters in other shows are so it's in a word <laughs> sensational <laughs> that's his word nice pop uh, out spencer what was that spencer like popped out to the side of <laughs> i didn't see him do it uh, it was good Please yeah. mute your Spencer. You're muted. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. My <laughs> parents are talking outside my door. <laughs> Spencer's about to get the door kicked in. Uh, Regan, where can our lovely people find you, my dear friend? Um, I am uh, at Regoba on Twitter. I am at Newt Reagan, N-U-T-E-R-A-Y-G-U-N on TikTok. Um, and my Instagram is locked down because I have a weirdo as it is. But that's where you can find me uh, for now. But um, yeah, it was, it was awesome to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. <laughs> Absolutely. As I said at the beginning, and we'll reiterate again, uh, Regan is one of my favorite uh, thought leaders in the Star Wars Twitter space. Uh, she is one of the goaded Star Wars Twitter glup shittos. Um, and if you're not following her uh, on Twitter for Star Wars stuff, you're a damn fool. And on TikTok, uh, because there's at least one fascinating anecdote a day uh, that is just perusing the, the, the depraved minds of man. Um, and Jared but- was my first Star Wars Twitter friend ever oh, and i thought that he hated me for the longest time and i'm really glad that wasn't true so no not at all not for a second <laughs> um but yeah uh go follow reagan on all the things connor where can the lovely people find you uh at least for now before you take a little breaky for connor yeah uh twitter def of banana it's there if you're <laughs> watching if you're listening that just said it um Instagram, ConmanJFO. Uh, you can find me oh, also on a podcast that Jared just guested on today. Well, not today, when you're listening, whenever this episode comes out. I don't know the passage of time. I also co host for now. I mean, I'll still be co hosting on it, but again, just break, just stuff. Uh, I co host over at For the Republic, a love letter to Star Wars animation. Uh, we talk about Star Wars, Shocker. We talk about the shows, the, the new and upcoming shows, plus Clone Wars. We just finished season one. We'll get to season two of Clone Wars in some way, shape, or form. I don't know when. Uh, where else? Oh, I also co-write questions and co-host a Star Wars fan trivia league called Star Wars in a Galaxy Epic Confrontations. Um, you can What's find that? all of our... You What's should know, like? Jared. It, it's... It sounds like there's cookie cops there. <laughs> there's a, Not there's, more, there's... I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> not that one. That one is very much not with us. That... Your two cookie cops are like, what was my father like? <laughs> well, he, was very, he was an old guy, a very good friend. <laughs> he got destroyed. He was destroyed by a in the trivia wars. Before the dark times, before Baton Rouge, <laughs> before the J row, before the J row, um, uh, you can find all of our past and future matches over at the Star Wars in a Galaxy podcast YouTube channel. Our most recent match was the rematch between Jared the Dark Jedi and a good friend of the show and partner. Scotty J Row of the Bombad cast. Uh, go check out the match. It was just a high stakes, just back and forth, a lot of fun, a lot of drama, a lot of stakes. Really interesting storytelling, I might add. Um, go check it out. Uh, and I'm blanking. Where the fuck else can you guys find me? Running down a street somewhere. I just did that like two you hours can find ago. Find him running. That's where you can find him. Yeah, I just did that two hours ago. Um, oh, sweditor slash fiction. 
Uh, I work with a group of people and we help create Star Wars fan stories. They're connected tangentially. We have about 20 stories published. We have many more on the way. I don't have any published yet, but I do have a bunch in the war. I, well, not a bunch. I have some in the works, all of which related to one of my favorite Jedi ever created, Cal Kestis. Uh, yeah, that's it. I don't know when the next, I don't know when my first story is coming out, but also I don't really care because that means I got more time to work on it and polish it because I'm a Let perfectionist. Let him cook. Sometimes. Let Connor cook. I can't cook. Um, no, I can't actually. No, he'd can't. been cooking. Uh, Spencer uh, doesn't have any social media and he's muted uh, because <laughs> Todd Prime. No, and they're Robin gone. Don't want to make. Oh, oh they're, okay. They're cool. gone. I just forgot to unmute. I was low key hoping for a Todd Prime cameo. I'm not gonna lie. No, that won't <laughs> happen. That's not happening. <laughs> Absolutely not. But anyway, uh, hi everybody. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure as always. <clears throat> you can find I, me at the Lincoln Highway Experience Museum, the uh, the largest museum in the country dedicated to history to America's first transcontinental highway from New York City to San Francisco, in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. You can find me there. Site director. Yeah. I'm the guy doing dishes. Nice. Site director, I'm the guy doing dishes. That was yeah, I, that was that was great. I'm, that was a fun little I got a promotion, but I'm still a glorified dishwasher. That's pretty much we it. We gotta we gotta start making sure Spencer has like a small cache of T Nat merch. So if anybody does show up and go Sell hey, it over here. the back of the museum. Just hide it. <laughs> hide it in a train car. Uh in the dish I should room. do that too. Uh, people just show up at these museums to get free merch from our podcast. Uh, <laughs> I really should do that if I'm being honest. It's like geocaching, like, but with t-shirts. But Jared, but Jared, can you imagine if I had just some spare merch on hand when the "Give Me a Dollar" guy came into the museum? Oh man. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, Reagan. Reagan. We got to play the clip, and then I got to show Regan the picture after we yeah. play the clip. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Kason. Where can the lovely people find you and uh, the band you manage? Oh, thank you. Wow. I didn't even have to say it now. Um, <laughs> right here at Cray Reezy on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and if you want to find the band that I'm in, they are super heavy. It's uh, deathcore, like extreme metal type stuff. Um, the link to their profile is in my Instagram bio, and also the link tree is in my Instagram bio. Go support my homies. Gang, gang. Hell yeah. You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at darkjedi2552. And you can find the Nerd Academy podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, wherever you get podcasts, and on our website, www.thenerdacademypodcast.com, where if you're feeling generous, you can donate to our Patreon. Give me a dollar! <laughs> uh, oh, it gets better. Spencer, I will let you tell this amazing story. Again, um, for yes, I'm blocked by the picture. I can finish my hot dog. Yeah, so I, I, or you can, Lizzie? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jared, you can, you can see all, you know, all try to, try to get him, try to catch him getting a big bite of it. <laughs> anyway, um, I was at the museum, uh, where I work and I just went into the diner and I was talking to these three people that seemed like very kind, but kind of unusual. In their appearance, or what? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got you, Casey. Uh, that's right. Like, he like, wasn't looking at the monitor farther away from him, so I thought I was safe. <laughs> no, because I pulled, I pulled the the streamyard window over here onto my laptop, so I'm just staring see, at you. I second guessed myself because I thought you might have done that, and then I was like, "Nah, he's doing something else." <laughs> <laughs> but I just said, I like, was mistaken. Yeah what are you guys up to? And they said, Oh, well, we're contractors for a local rena like a Renaissance fair. So we travel all over the place. We've been working together for years. And I'm like, Oh, that's crazy. What oh, and pause. I took that video of that guy at the Pittsburgh Renaissance festival. Yeah. Uh, he was, he was there. He was yelling, give me a dollar at everybody. And we walked past and I looked at Taylor or no, Taylor looked at me. She said, that would be a really funny clip for whenever you promote the Patreon at the end of the podcast. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. <laughs> so I like sprinted back like, you know, 30 feet, um, gave him a dollar. And I said, say, give me a dollar. I'm going to put you on my podcast. And he went, 
give me a dollar uh and then went with it and then we have been using that clip for like two years now back to spencer <laughs> yeah fast forward to like the end of last summer and these three renaissance fair contractors are sitting at the diner t counter and my museum and they're like yeah this guy's a literal hobo like he's he's just an actual bum i'm like wait a minute like like a bum <gasps> and i saw his face i'm like it has to be you it has to be you it 100 has to be so yeah I, that's how i got my picture and uh met met uh, our very own give me a dollar guy yeah. that's amazing <laughs> you can totally see the resemblance play the clip again <laughs> You can totally, again. look at his Give me a dollar. You can totally <laughs> tell it's him. It's, it was awesome. But yeah, that's, can you side by side those? Well, that story I with can't joy. currently know, but uh, mm. next Pittsburgh Renaissance Festival, I'm going to be getting a new one, just horizontal. Um, Make it last longer, too. Yes, I know. Well, that, that's a StreamYard <laughs> update that cuts all our clips off, um, which frustrates me. I had to get a bunch of new clips or new versions of uh, this motherfucker don't miss. Got that dog in him. Sensational. So they didn't get cut off at the end. Uh, but yeah. Uh, speaking of our patrons, thank you to our $10 alumnus, Keandre Lloyd. Do a flip. Do a flip. Uh, I have to ask because I've realized there's a lot of people who come on this show as guests who don't notice it. Reagan, did you notice the man doing a backflip in the theater? No, I did not. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now you have to play it all. You got to play again. it again. You got to watch real close. It's towards the bottom of the screen. Oh. To our other $10 patron, Paco, or as he's going by on our Patreon now, Trivia King, Scotty J. Rowe. <laughs> that man, that man confuses me. scares me. <laughs> Who's now going by? 10 million J. Rowe's, baby. No, no, no. Paco has been facilitating me getting to play an Alex Jones clip of the every every episode of my goddamn podcast. And as a punishment for losing to Scotty, changed his name from the Alex Jones joke and asked for a new clip. Yeah. And here I stand holding the bag of my defeat. Uh, <laughs> Taking L's left and right. Scotty scares me sometimes. Like I've said Maybe I'll walk out of here tomorrow it. and you never see me again. That's really what I want to do. Sorry, Connor. I had clipped. I had clicked on it by the time you had started speaking, and it lagged. No, it's just that he sometimes scares me. He scares all of us. I, I love Try the guy. He's such room, a wild so card. Than you are better than you. I am God. I was like, whoa, 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 Scotty. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> <a God." laughs> Try being in the room for the cookie cop execution. <laughs> well, listen, I kind of, I would have loved to be there. God, I, Scotty unhinged like that was so good on live, like on the on the air. It was that awesome. was the that was amazing. Yeah, Scotty unhinged. And I, I can't like, believe actually, I was like, witnessing that. Cookie cop was crazy. It's literal sparks flew. I yes, I saw <laughs> the sparks coming off the hammer. It was uh. Go watch. Well, it's uh, it's on our channel, too. I keep forgetting to promote that it's here. We made a last-minute decision for it to stream on this channel, too. So you can watch it here as well. Dude, Cookie Cop's head, like, being stuck to the hammer and just that being, like, in the center of the camera was one of the most yeah. unintentionally beautiful uh, things to ever come out of Epic Confrontations. It's my Twitter header now. It's so good. I mean, I need, yeah. It, it's so good. But... Anyway, uh, thank you all so very much for watching. $5 patrons, Shock T versus Darth Vader is the next episode of the Versus series. That'll be coming out early next month, so stay tuned for that. Uh, at the $5 tier of our Patreon, you get access to the back catalog of our entire Knights of the Nerd Republic Versus series. 
uh, that has around 30 episodes of bonus content for you to fill your eyes or ears with uh, of Spencer and I uh, going all the way in, getting in the weeds with some uh, force user on force user combat. So check that out. $10 patrons, you get a shout out at the end of every episode. Uh, there's an episode of TNAP proper out this week as well, where we go over the tranche of trailers we got this past, these past couple weeks. So go check all of that out. Uh, Reagan, thank you for stopping by. Thank you to all of our lovely uh, viewers and listeners. Amando season three review will be out uh, very soon. So thank you all so very much for watching. We are honored that you have joined us. And may the force be with motherfucker. <laughs> she was waiting. I can tell. I can tell she was waiting to do that. Wait, 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 wait. Do you all know what she's talking about? I okay. I'll be. I'm. Like, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. No. I went on Twitter to see if I could find you oh, and follow you wait. before I log off of Twitter and then never touch it again. And that was like one of the first things that popped up. I like I, I just like in the regular feed, it was in there. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to have to revisit that. Okay, hold on. I'm going to play it on the episode right now. I'm pulling it up on Twitter. <laughs> I forgot about that. Reagan, oh, I just amazing. I just want you to know and this this is this does I mean this with the very very humblest and best intended heart. You don't know what an honor it is that I logged on to Twitter specifically so I could You don't. Him. You don't. This so man stupid. This man used Twitter for one day. Once. That was to help promote the first match between Scotty and I and then all that happened was everybody pretended to not know his goddamn name. <laughs> yeah. And they still don't, as a matter of fact. They still don't know my name. Eli makes the same three jokes, and that's one of the same three jokes he makes. And it's just like, you know his name, Eli. Just say it. This isn't like some, like, Martha-type situation. He's not the candy man. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This isn't like some, like, Batman versus Superman, like, Martha-type situation. Like, you know his name. Okay, let's not talk shit on the Martha thing. I like Martha. I'm not even saying, I'm not even, I'm not even talking shit on it. That was, like, the only thing that came to me. So. Oh, man, I gotta find it. Oh, man, Spencer, open Twitter and send it to me on Twitter. (laughs) Oh, dude, that was like ten minutes ago. I don't. I, I didn't share the clip though. I never shared the clip. I it just was. It was in my feed whenever I oh. first logged in. Oh, I need it. This episode is not ending until I can play it. I'm not kidding. Oh, oh my goodness. Well, I think it was not in the episode. Uh, I'm not going to be able to find it fast enough. We're just. We'll just have to. We'll have to get it ready for next time. Can I go tinfoil hat for a second gotta, while you I wait? Gotta, sure, go for it. All right. So listen, right? So like Ahsoka has been in the world between worlds, right? Yeah. Do we know if she yeah. spent some serious time there? What do you mean? Do, do we know if Ahsoka has spent some serious time in the world between worlds? I mean, like, she hasn't spent time in the world between worlds. Like she got pulled out and then went back to her original jared i just sent you the youtube of it oh thank you i you're the best (laughs) oh here here we go this is so stupid i love it it makes me so happy i'm so surprised connor has not seen this oh wait no 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 i have i have i just remembered like when because i didn't hear what reagan said clearly at first and i was like oh it's that clip but like just play it because like it's just it needs to be played (laughs) <laughs> at this point. It's amazing. I so the joke is that whatever this hands up when walks away, it sounds like he's saying I'm out motherfucker. I don't know if anyone else could have heard heard that or could hear the I'm out motherfucker, but I'm, I'm highlight of the season. On that lag for me. Spoken in Mando. Um what? I'll fix that. Well, there was. I love it. Anyway, uh, show's over. I got my little vanity clip in there. Goodbye. <laughs>